Welcome to Lesson 6, Painting and Retouching. What you'll find in this little video snippet is little tips and tricks that might help you with your reading in Lesson 6 of the book. And what I'm going to cover is just a little bit about color, CMYK versus RGB, using the brush tool, applying color to an image, and even doing some retouching. So hopefully this will help you kind of get an idea of um, different things that you can take advantage of using colors in Photoshop. So just to start out, I'm just going to do a little basic rundown about the differences between CMYK and RGB because this always seems to baffle people. I'm going to choose File, Browse and Bridge just so that I have easy access to my entire folder and I'm actually now working in the PSO6 Lessons folder. I'm opening up PSO6 CMYK. Now when you open this up you'll see that I actually have auto select already selected which gives me the opportunity as the user to use my move tool and just randomly click on these different layers and you'll notice that it's automatically selecting the correct layer. Now notice that when I am moving around the CMYK swatches here that I'm creating additional colors. This is actually called subtractive colors when you use CMYK and this is what you typically print with whether you're printing perhaps on your desktop printer or could be a high resolution press but basically you'll see that when I cross cyan and yellow it's creating green and when I cr uh, cross over the magenta and the blue or the cyan I'm getting a darker blue the cyan and the yellow a red and this is just because of the way the light is being filtered now another method or mode that you'll be working in especially when you're working in Photoshop is the um, RGB mode and this is typically unless you're working in some color managed environment where you're working in lab or some other color mode but typically your images from digital cameras and scanners are coming in in the RGB mode and this is light generated or called additive color and what you'll notice it's a little backwards from CMYK because when you look at CMYK where all these colors combine you actually have black here when you're printing you might hear the terminology CMYK, K stands for black and the K supposedly came from that being the key plate that they would align or register the other plates on but black is usually added because when you really mix on paper with press magenta and cyan and yellow you sort of get mud here now coming back though that's very dark the combination of those three colors when it's additive color what happens when all three colors are combined? You've got light and that's why it's a little confusing to people who are used to reading values. The higher the value in RGB, the actual lighter the color. But voila, look at this. The uh, red and the blue make the magenta, the green and the red make yellow, and the blue and the green make cyan. Now, why I'm mentioning this is because a lot of people instantly directly go into CMYK. They open up an image and bam, they choose image, mode, CMYK. And why that's bad is because there are lots of different CMYKs. And typically what happens is when you convert to CMYK, you're choosing something based upon a predetermined setting. Now let me just bring up an example here. I'll close these files. No, no, don't want to save them. I'm going to click on the launch bridge icon up in the application bar and open up this very colorful image. And what you'll see, this is very saturated and perhaps not totally able to print in CMYK. I am in the RGB mode. You can see that up here in the name. But I want to show you a little tip or trick that you can use. If you press Control Y or of course Command Y, notice the color changes. Do you also notice CMYK appears up here after the slash? This is essentially saying, hey, here's how your file looks when it's an RGB, but change it to CMYK, this is how it looks. What it's doing is it's looking at my present CMYK settings in Photoshop and trying to build the best preview it can as to how this is really going to print when I actually do output this file to CMYK or when I change the mode. And so it is a suggested view. I mean, if you're not working in a color managed environment, 
you've got windows and things that conflict with your monitor color. Um, it's not going to be totally accurate, but it does give you an idea that perhaps the colors in here are a little too saturated for conversion to CMYK. Um, now, here's what those settings are based upon. If I come into my edit color settings, you'll see that I'm set at the default and it's North America General Purpose 2. And if I leave it at this, it's not really going anywhere. It's saying, okay, if you were to print this to CMYK, we're going to assume it's going to a web coded stock. This is not the internet. A web press is those big presses with wheels that, you know, a spool of paper that you might have a magazine or catalog printed on. Um, that's what it's looking at. Notice that if I change this, let's bring this down, I can choose, like, perhaps I want to go to pre-press. Pre-press. Now, when I press the control Y now or command Y, it's now giving me a different preview based upon these particular settings. And this is now kind of positioning itself for uh, pre-press. You do want to come into your color settings. It's important and set them, whether you're doing web internet or pre-press, because when you do change the mode, for instance, if I do change my mode right now to CMYK, it is using these settings in order to make that conversion. That's why you don't want to change your image immediately. What if you're not going to web code it and I just converted this to CMYK? What if I'm actually going to sheet fed code it, which would be maybe a smaller printer and you're doing brochures, or maybe I'm doing uncoded paper, which you'll see a change there. Notice if I come back up here into code it, you see a little change in those colors. It's saying, hey, you know what? There's a little bit more that you're not going to get when you switch to uncode it. And so if I were to convert this to CMYK with these settings, I would lose the opportunity to go back to those more vibrant colors later, even though I might be going to a coded stock. So typically people work in RGB until they're done and they're sure where they're going. Now just a note, I'm changing my color settings directly in Photoshop and I'm getting this little unsynchronized setting. So if you have installed the entire Creative Suite application into your computer, you can actually go into Bridge and choose Edit Color Settings and change your Creative Suite color settings for all of your applications at once. Okay, so moving on with this, just one other thing to note. Um, I am in the preview. The preview also works if you go into your color picker. For perhaps in here, I want to choose Proof My Colors. Um, I can do it in the picker or I can even put a gamut warning on. Now this is showing me the colors that are not going to appear very well when they're converted to CMYK or do not convert well. And just something to keep in mind here um, is that this is based upon my present uncoded se settings that I just left this at. If you have coded settings, you might get more of these colors. Again, it's dependent upon what your present color settings are. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off and cancel this. Okay, just another thing here. Simple stuff, but perhaps I want to choose a color here. Notice that if I click on the set foreground color, this color picker comes up. This represents the color space, and if you could see this entire area here, this would be a big wheel, and this would be the center. And a lot of people do this. They're like, I want to pick a cool color. And they go, blue. Okay, there's still a black. Why? because they're in the center of the wheel and it's just kind of getting stuck in there. Now, if you actually want to change a color, you've got to pull it out of the center. Now, notice what happens here. I'm pulling it out and all of a sudden, ding, I get this little warning bar up here. This is telling me, hey, that's a real cool color, but based upon your present color settings, never going to print. If I click on that, it says, but don't worry, you can get this color. Now, this can be rather disappointing depending upon the colors that you have selected. Like, for instance, Maybe I'm a fashion designer and I have this cool pantsuit in purple and I want to show it. Oops, nope, can't, can't achieve that color. And this is typically things that happen in production, so just keep them in mind. Um, this little cube, this is saying your color's not web safe. If I click on that, I can make that color web safe, which is not necessarily a big issue nowadays as much as it was several years ago. But keep that in mind, or you can just 
check that you want to see only web colors in here. And there's your hexadecimal value down there if you need it. Okay, so moving on. I'm going to go ahead and close up this file and just create a new blank file to show you some painting tips and tricks. And I'm going to switch to the paintbrush. Now, notice that when I move my paintbrush out here on my cursor, I get a circle that's showing me the width of my brush at this time. Now, if I have my caps lock key down, I get a precision cursor. I have seen people reinstall Photoshop because they can't see their cursor. Just understand it's because my caps lock key is down. And when I press caps lock key again, I can see my cursor again. So when I start painting, notice that it's the diameter of that brush. If I want to make my brush size larger, I can do this one of several ways. One is I can just right click and my brush panel comes up immediately and I can change a size and a hardness directly here and then start painting. Or my favorite way is just to simply use the brackets to the right of the letter P on the keyboard. The right bracket makes the brush larger, left bracket makes it smaller. You want the brush harder or softer, shift right bracket makes the brush harder, shift left bracket makes the brush softer. You want to sample a color, hmm, this doesn't have a lot of color in it, I'm not going to save it, it's pretty ugly, and open up a couple images here. Now, I open up these images, I'm going to choose the arrange documents and tell it to put these two up. Maybe I want to paint some of this color on this image. First of all, if I want to sample a color, I can just, while I'm on any painting tool, hold down my Alt or Option key and voila, click on the color I want to sample and it appears as my foreground color. Now, if I want to paint on this image, notice that this mode up here is in grayscale. This one's in RGB. If I start painting this now, that particular color that I've selected will paint in a shade of gray. If I want it to paint in color, I need to take this image and choose mode and make it RGB. It doesn't change the way the image looks, but it gives me the opportunity to now paint with color. Now this doesn't necessarily look so great, does it? It's kind of like a coloring book. I'm going to undo that by pressing Control or Command Z. Notice that when you paint, you can take advantage of blending modes. So like for instance, I can come in here and choose overlay to get a different effect or perhaps I want to choose color and say, just give me the color only. Um, color is used a lot for colorizing pictures because it keeps the gray scale intact. So I can actually come in here and I'll click on this green plant and fill this plant in. Get a little more green. I can change the opacity so it looks a little bit more realistic. Like for instance, that's a little orange there. I'm going to alt click on the tan and say, all right, that looks a little better. But I can even change the opacity. Now, a couple things. When you're changing the opacity, you can do that either by using your slider at the top in the options or by simply pressing the values. So for instance, if I want 25% opacity, I can type 25 or 25, or I can press 1 for 10%. Or if I want to go back to 100%, press 0. So it's really easy to switch your opacity on the fly as well. Let's take this a little further. These have been interesting, but they're going to go. No. No. I am going to browse again in Bridge and open up a couple other images here. So I've got these two images up here. I'm going to choose two up. First of all, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that I can see a little bit more maybe somewhere around here. Whoop. Okay. Rechatching tools, lots of neat things that you can take advantage of. Clone stamp is probably the most common tool, but there's also the spot healing brush and the healing brush tool. Difference between these tools, the spot healing brush, I don't have to set a source for. Notice I'm just painting over this and it's doing, it's kind of mushing whatever I'm selecting and blending it together. It's applying blending modes and a little bit of clone stamp. It doesn't always work great. You can see it works really good in blemishes and such, but in this area, it might not have been the best use of it. But if I were to come in here and just kind of dab different areas, perfect. Now I'm gonna hold down my spacebar and slide back up. I also have the healing brush tool, which allows me to alt click to set a source. 
and then I can paint that in as well. So if I alt click and come over here, you can see it blends in those colors a little better. Now, just like the other brush tools, you can make your you can hit the right bracket to make it larger. You can press shift left bracket to make it a little softer so that the retouching is blended in a little bit better. Now, the standard tool that has been used in the past over and over again, of course, has been the clone stamp tool. And if I want to use this tool, it's almost an exact, well, it is an exact replica of the pixels in which I'm determining to copy. So if I alt click right here, you'll see that when I start painting a crosshair, and it's exactly duplicating those same pixels where I'm painting. The benefit to that is that as you're painting, you can kind of see ahead of time where you are pulling your information from. So like for instance, now new in Photoshop CS4, you're getting a pre little mini preview. You can see in there, I'm getting a preview of what I'm cloning. So if I I'll click on the boot, do you see there's that dark boot part appearing before I actually click and start painting. Now I'm going to alt click here and paint this in. But um, I can also change the opacity of this as I'm working. Okay, so now let's say that I want to continue cloning if I had all day, which I don't. Um, you know, you could use either the healing tools or your rubber stamp tool to come in here and replace these. You might want to consider, depending upon what you're doing, changing the opacity as you do any retouching. Sometimes I go down to an 80% just because uh, if you're doing skin, all of a sudden it looks like you might be grafting something on instead of a more realistic transition into your cloned area. Now what I can also do is take advantage of a clone source panel. The clone source panel is where you can also turn off and on that show overlay so that I can see what I'm painting before I actually click. I like it so I usually leave it on. But it is also an area where you can set multiple clone sources. So for instance my first clone source is right here. Okay. My second clone source might be over here. My third clone source might be, hmm, we'll take this from another image. Notice it recognizes that I went to another image. So you can save multiple clone sources up to five. Now I'm going to control zero and just use my spacebar to slide over a little bit. Notice I can see this coming from the other image. Now I'm going to make my brush size larger. See how I can see what I'm going to clone? Isn't that great? I'm going to change the opacity by simply pressing two. So now it's a 20%. I might even just say, um, can you change the blend mode to darken? And now when I paint, you just see a light little color of that coming in. So neat stuff that you can take advantage of, um, subtleties. Now, something more major. This corner, I like better than this corner. So I'm going to take this corner and clone it. I'm going to, first of all, undo my little swirly here, and I'm just pressing Control-Z. I'm going to change my clone source, alt-click to this corner. You see I've got my corner here, but I can rotate that. So I'm going to change that to a 90 degree angle. And look, I can fit it right in there and I can see it before I paint it. And then, oops, let me change the opacity up to 100. Normal, 100. I can press zero to do that too. Okay. But a perfect little corner placed in there. So take advantage of the clone source panel. It's an excellent tool. It was actually not new in CS4, but CS3, but a lot of people haven't really discovered it yet.